So those familiar with Dave Bogatka and his claims, we will be examining those as well. And it in the post-Epstein era, it's probably not as surprising. Before Epstein, a lot of the coincidence theorists and the cognitive dissonant authority-worshipping cultists, they simply did could not believe that any kind of so-called officials, politicians, law enforcement, could ever be involved in any kind of clubs or cults or human trafficking or any of this weirdness. But now in the post-Epstein era, coincidence theorists are being exposed a left and right as simply Dunning-Kruger goofs who are not believing the evidence right in front of their eyes, the obvious blatant corruption and complicity in these so-called elite circles. Now, what is going on in Manitowoc? Is it also present in Manitowoc? If so, is it really that surprising? I don't know. We're going to have to examine this information with logic and reason on the forefront completely objectively, without hallucinating anything is true or untrue, examining all avenues in typical mind shock fashion. So let's actually go over Dave Bogatka and uh, his saga a little bit more in depth, and this possible secret club, good old boys club of corruption and the occult. So it's also actually curious that this news report came out August 30th, 2005, and this is curious. This was put out on productionsouth.wordpress.com referencing this post. New Criminal Justice Commission formed for Wisconsin in an effort to improve, I don't know what newspaper this is from, but in an effort to improve Wisconsin's criminal justice system by identifying and remedying problems that have led to wrongful convictions, legal officials from around the state have formed a new Wisconsin Criminal Justice Study Commission. The panel's first meeting will be held Wednesday, August 31st from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. at the State Bar Center in Madison. The commission was formed by the State Bar of Wisconsin, the University of Wisconsin Law School, Marquette University Law School, and Wisconsin Attorney General Peg Lautenschlager. So this is a guards guarding themselves situation where Peggy, one of the top pegs in this corruption board, has to oversee, is, is part of the commission that oversees the corruption, so she can make sure that the true corruption is never exposed to keep an eye on things. So this was a post October 28, 2017 by ProductionSouthWordPress.com. The framing of Stephen Avery began August 31st, 2005. On August 31st, 2005, the Avery Task Force was taken over and renamed the Criminal Justice Study Commission by Peg Lautenschlager and none other than Jerome Buting, who represented the criminal law section of the Wisconsin State Bar. This is a fact. And for those that haven't checked out the previous episodes on Mindshock, I actually go over Strang and Buting. This group had ceded to it sheriffs, Judges, prosecutors, attorneys, senators, DCI, and state crime lab affiliates. Jerome Buting was seated alongside those with a political agenda stemming from Stephen Avery's exoneration. Do you think, out of all of Buting's colleagues, he's really the only one who thinks Stephen was innocent? Think again. Peg Lautenschlager distributed pamphlets in September 2005. The content in these pamphlets were drafted by Jerome Buting, working as her lead author. Keep in mind, October 31st, 2005, it wasn't until over a month later that uh, Teresa Hallback was allegedly killed. So all of this is going on one to two months prior. The content covered was jailhouse snitches, tunnel vision, contaminated DNA, false witness statements, and electronic monitoring of juveniles. How coincidental. This is all quite coincidental. This was basically a how to convict Bible indicating to her bad apples how they were to frame Stephen Avery. Notice Buting neither Lautenschlager defends these very political agendas that the cops used to frame Stephen and Brennan with, and the commission was supposed to prevent this. 
follow the money trail. Peg Lautenschlager held three attorney general conferences right before Hallback died. Let me read that again. Peg Lautenschlager held three attorney general conferences right before Hallback died, or allegedly died. Lautenschlager has access to every department that would work with the Hallback investigation and paid them off in advance with money from settling numerous civil suits as the attorney general. There was no way Stephen Avery was winning a civil suit for $36 million as long as she was the protector of the DOJ budget. She took over the Avery task force and renamed it because her hate towards Stephen Avery became personal. After Stephen was arrested and the coercion was in place for Brendan Dassey, Lawton Schlager made certain her lead author, Jerome Buting, was assured a spot on the defense council to clean up after her. Jerome Buting was there to only compliment the prosecutors in a very highly political conviction. Jerome Buting was attached to Lawton Schlager even at the time Stephen hired him. This is a fact. Avery's trial was rigged on both ends. You have to start looking beyond Avery Road and follow the money trail. The research is done. Former Attorney General Peg Lawton Schlager has declined to speak for 12 years. Kathleen Zellner, it's time to get her to squeal and Buting. Jerome Buting forgot to tell you. His political affiliation with Lautenschlager before Teresa Hallback's death and after, that for a fact spanned three years starting with Stephen's exoneration. My book, Beyond Avery Road, Beauty and the Beast, explains exactly what every one of you have missed. Why? Because Buting had 10 episodes in Making a Murder to blow the whistle on Attorney General Lautenschlager. However, Buting kept your eyes focused on prosecutor Ken Kratz. Special prosecutor. Very special. Ken Kratz is a special individual. But Assistant Attorney General Thomas J. Fallon was the main power for the state sent in by Lautenschlager from the same office. This Fallon is Dean Strang's best friend. Starting to make sense how the ball was purposely dropped during the trial, the evidence is real. Buting has been protecting Lautenschlager. When you open your eyes and learn that you have all been deceived, then you'll know exactly how Stephen Avery was framed. For the love of Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey and their freedom, this is the book that holds all the answers, all the answers beyond Avery Road. A gentleman, okay, so moving on here to Dave Bogotka. A, a gentleman from Manitoba County, Dave Bogotka, has posted three YouTube videos in which he explains that he was jet skiing by the beach in 1985 when Penny Bernston was assaulted. Avery was convicted of that assault. He went to jail for 18 years and then was exonerated thanks to DNA evidence. On YouTube, the man who saw Bernston on the beach that day says there was something fishy going on. He seems to think the assault actually was connected to the alleged sex club, but pinned on Avery. He believes that many prominent businessmen, cops, and school employees were part of this secret sex club. He claims that a month or two after the attack, he was shown Polaroids of naked members of the club and was encouraged to join. Redditor Dena Abuses Kvath sums it up thusly. The club threatened him because he refused to join. And he suspects them of ruining his business and murdering his manager, a woman who died under suspicious circumstances. Her boyfriend was falsely accused of shooting her, but then the death was ruled a heart attack. So that's kind of weird, too. So they booked the boyfriend. They accused him of shooting her, but she actually wasn't shot and died of a heart attack instead. That's weird. Stephen Avery had no particular reason to rape and murder a woman on Halloween, but Halloween would be the number one day. For a satanic sex cult to have a ritual sacrifice, even if it was just some goth kids playing wannabe devil worshippers for fun. And that's an interesting point. Why Avery, who has $36 million to gain with this lawsuit, why he would kill anybody or draw suspicion to himself, let alone on Halloween. I mean, that is, that is curious. Another user, J.K. Schmidt, writes, I think the sex cult theory is incredibly interesting, especially since it is later revealed that Calumet County District Attorney Special Prosecutor Ken Kratz was sexually harassing a bunch of his clients and had to check into a sex prescription drug rehab program. 
So here we have our experiences relating to the Stephen Avery saga and The Club, operating in Manitowoc County by Dave and Sandra Bogotka. Intro. For years, Dave has been sharing this information both offline and on the internet. What follows is a detailed statement. The bulk of it is from Dave about his direct experiences and thoughts on what happened. Dave dictated the statement and his wife Sandra transcribed it. The last few paragraphs regarding Halloween 2005 includes events that both Sandra and Dave were involved in. Assault in 1985. On the afternoon of July 29, 1985, Dave was riding a jet ski with a friend on Lake Michigan just off the shoreline of Two Rivers, Wisconsin. And it'd be curious too if the friend corroborated everything Dave said. Tom's uh, Two Rivers is a small town in Manitowoc County located adjacent to the city of Manitowoc. There's a large sandy public beach at the location with a jet ski launching area. Dave was attentive to what was happening on the beach and road due to the fact that residents in the area had been complaining to police about noise from jet skiers. That day, he noticed what struck him as extra activity on the road next to the beach. He observed several City of Two Rivers squad cars and at least one unmarked county sheriff's vehicle. Dave knew the unmarked cars. Anyone could drive by the sheriff's open lot and see them. While out on the water, Dave saw a man speaking to the friend he was hanging out with that day. He thought it might be a cop. So he rode his jet ski into the beach to find out what was going on. The man who'd been speaking to Dave's friend had left. Dave's friend told him that the guy, who turned out to be Penny Bernstein's husband, said he was going to call the cops. Dave's friend explained that the man was concerned about his wife who had been jogging north on the beach. She'd not returned in the time frame he expected, and he'd not been able to locate her. Mr. Bernstein was gone for only a short time and then returned to the beach. At the same time, a Two Rivers police officer named Charlie Clow arrived. Dave had seen Charlie Clow driving through the area earlier. The two approached Dave and his friend. Mr. Bernstein suggested that Dave could ride his jet ski up to shoreline to look for his wife. The police officer said he didn't feel that Dave needed to do this. However, Dave thought it made good sense to go look, and so he did. That's weird. So the police officer is encouraging a civilian not to help another civilian and just ride up and down the shore looking for a missing person. Interesting. Dave rode the jet ski north along the shore. As he traveled away from the launch area, he observed a man and a woman walking north on the beach carrying a white towel. Dave didn't know their names, but he recognized them as being local. They were on the beach in the area where there are houses close by. The lay of the land is as such. Heading north from the municipal beach in Two Rivers, there is a residential area for about a quarter mile. After that, there are no houses close to the beach. It is state land, which consists of beach, dunes, a strip of swampy forested area, and then a road. County Highway O. Dave proceeded on the jet ski for about six miles north along the shoreline until he arrived at Molash Creek. This did not take long as the jet ski could go about 30 to 35 miles per hour. Near the creek, Dave saw another man and woman, so he pulled in to speak to them. He explained he was looking for a woman jogging down the beach had they seen her. They stated yes, they had seen her. She'd run past them and then turned back to the south jogging towards the public beach in Two Rivers. Dave again took off on his jet ski headed south. Dave estimates he rode about four to five miles when he saw a woman in a mad run from the sand dunes. She was running as if for her life. Her swimsuit top was missing and she was covered in blood. The couple Dave had seen earlier walking with the white towel were sitting on the beach in front of the location where the woman was running. Penny Bernstein was the woman. They were looking at Dave. He pointed to the dunes behind them as he was driving towards the shore. At this point, the couple on the beach saw Miss Bernstein. Dave drove his jet ski up on the beach so fast he lost control and was flung off. He got up and was on the scene as Miss Bernstein ran past him to the couple who covered her with the towel. Around the same time, Bernstein and two police, two Rivers police officers, Charlie Clow and Bill Barrow, ran up. Miss Bernstein was embraced by her husband and was sobbing and was very upset. Dave asked the police what had happened. They told Dave she was assaulted by a man. 
Dave grew up in the area and was very familiar with the trails between the beach and the road. His first thought was to go after whoever had done this to the woman and catch the guy or at least get a license plate from any cars that might be on the road. So he took off running up the dunes. The dunes were high enough that a person standing on the beach could not see over them to the area beyond. As Dave crested the first dunes, the police behind him were frantically yelling no, no, and for him to stop and return to the beach. Dave halted on top of the dune, and it was at this point he witnessed several men in the area behind the dunes. One man was to the south of Dave about 20 to 30 feet. This man was lying prone on the dune, peeking over the top toward the scene on the beach. Dave isn't positive, but he thinks he was wearing a suit like a business suit. Another man was standing about 20 to 30 feet to the west of Dave. He got a good look at this man. He appeared to be picking things up from the ground, but stopped when he saw Dave. Dave says he was bug-eyed, mouth gaping, wide open with surprise as they made eye contact. He also looked a lot like Gregory Allen. Of course, Dave did not know about Gregory Allen at the time. However, after seeing his picture years later, Dave immediately said that he looked like one of the guys he saw in the dunes. Closer to the woods, further west from Dave, there were a few other men who seemed to be walking in the direction of the woods. All the people were dressed in plains clothes, no uniforms. The officers behind Dave were greatly agitated and yelling at him. So Dave returned and walked back to the beach. The officers there told Dave that Miss Beardson had passed out and that they, the police, had people over there and they didn't want Dave to mess up the crime scene. Was that not the crime scene, though? Or was it? At this point, Dave got back on the jet ski and proceeded south to the Two Rivers Public Beach. The other thing that's curious, we never went over this, but is it possible Beardson was assaulted by more than one guy? like these other police officers, and that she was just threatened into pointing the finger at Avery. I mean, that would be even a darker turn here, but okay. At this point, Dave got back on the jet ski, proceeded south to the Two Rivers public beach. Miss Bjornsson was escorted down the beach to an ambulance that was waited. That was waiting. Dave doesn't recall filling out an official statement, but does remember the cop but it does remember the cops implying that he, Dave, didn't need to do anything further because he didn't witness anything significant. So witnessing the victim running from a particular area is not significant, and witnessing all these other people in the area is not significant. Weird. The Bernstons later sent Dave a thank you note and a gift certificate for use in their candy store in Manitowoc. Dave learned through the media that Stephen Avery had been charged in the assault and details that were presented to the public. He also heard from locals that the good old boys club were taking care of the situation to make sure that Stephen Avery was sent to prison. Naked Pictures, The Club. Not long, a month or two after the incident on the beach, Dave was at Two Rivers Tire and Muffler, where he worked. A co-worker approached Dave and said a man wanted to speak to him. And this man is known, but his name is not listed here. This man was and is a very prominent member of the community. Side note, we have not stated this person's name. We feel this individual is very influential, having held office in local and state politics, and we are concerned about backlash. This man spoke to Dave and told him that we would like to invite you to join a special men's club. He showed Dave some photographs. In them were naked men, some of whom Dave recognized. There were at least two high school teachers and a junior Ramblers football coach. They appeared to be engaging in sexual acts. There were multiple men in each photo, like some kind of group thing was going on. The guy told Dave that the club members met at various hotels and venues in the area, and not to worry, sometimes they got girls. He stated that many business owners and prominent people were in this club, and that it was advantageous to be a member. He said Dave should come and talk to him and let him know if he wanted to participate. Dave was freaked out by this. He was 19 years old at the time, and didn't know what to say. He put the guy off and said he'd get back to him. Afterwards, Dave recalls feeling stunned. He was mystified as to why this guy would show him these pictures and invite him to join this club. It was extremely weird. First learning about a club. 
now we're going back to, in time to describe incidents that happened when Dave was a kid. He feels that they also relate to this club and are relevant to painting a picture of the culture that is part of the Manitowoc County area. On several occasions, when Dave was between four and eight years old, he was the victim and witness to domestic violence. These acts were committed against his family by a police officer. In one of the last and most dramatic of these incidents, Dave and his family, single mother and younger sister, were forced to go into hiding because the police officer who committed the acts could not be located. Dave and his family left town and hid out at some sort of Catholic-affiliated retreat in northern Wisconsin. Despite the police, a priest, several nuns, and a guidance counselor being involved and aware of the specifics of the incident, the events seemed to get covered up. It was later implied to Dave not to worry. The good old boys club had taken care of it. Fast forward to Dave's freshman year in high school. After Dave quit football, two boys on the team began to bully Dave. One of the boys' fathers was rumored to be a big shot in this good old boy's club. These two began spreading rumors about Dave's mother. They said that the boy's father, the one rumored to be in the club, had made derogatory claims regarding Dave's mom. The stigma of this followed Dave throughout his school days. Later on in the 90s, Dave had another run-in with his father in regards to the club. Dave's Dungeon. In 1986, when Dave was 20, he bought a bar in the city of Manitowoc on 21st and Hamilton Street. And Hamilton Streets. You can own a bar when you're 20, so you just can't serve or drink alcohol, but you can own the bar. Interesting. The bar was called Dave's Dungeon. It was in the basement of a building, the top portion of which consisted of apartments. The place wasn't open more than a few weeks, and a man came in. While Dave was bartending. I guess you can bartend when you're 20 in Manitowoc in 1986. Dave didn't know the guy. He sat at the bar and ordered a few beers. He explained to Dave that he was sent by the club to speak to him. He went on to say that Dave needed to go to the basement of the Eagles Club located in Manitowoc in order to join this club. He didn't say who Dave was supposed to see, just where he should go. He was insistent that Dave must join this club. Dave asked him why. Why would he be interested in joining this? The guy then explained how it worked. Essentially, he described racketeering to Dave. He didn't call it that, but it was the textbook definition. Dave told this fellow, sure, just to get him to leave him alone, but he had no intention of going to join anything. Time passes, month or two walks by, into the bar walks the junior Ramblers football coach. This was one of the guys in the pictures Dave was shown after the assault on the beach. The guy is friendly to Dave, but starts reeling off the same speech as the man who had been in there before. Dave needed to go to the Eagles club and join this club. Dave has the aha moment. This football coach was in the pictures. This is all part of the same club. This reinforces Dave's desire not to become involved with whomever it's so important he goes see in the Eagles basement. Dave blows the guy off, telling him sure he'll go down there. Not. <laughs> Over the course of the next year, the in the course of the ne over the course of the next year that Dave was actively tending his bar, the same guy from the photos comes in several times. On each occasion, he adamantly requests that Dave go join this club. He practically begs Dave, telling him things such as you don't want to get on the wrong side of these guys. Finally, the last time Dave encounters this fellow, he becomes belligerent. He starts yelling and waving his fist at Dave. Before storming out of the bar, he tells Dave he'd better take care of joining or else something is going to happen. There were other people in the bar at the time who witnessed this. They even asked Dave what the guy's problem was. That's interesting. It's always interesting when there's individuals around who can corroborate these stories. Something to add is that almost immediately after Dave opened the bar, there had been one problem after another. Three different people were suing him. The city authority on housing was getting after him about the apartments in the building. There were burglaries and vandalisms. And vandalism. It may have just been bad luck, but Dave wonders now if it could have been related to him refusing to join this club. 
Mary Ann. About a year after Dave opened the bar, he hired Mary Ann Den. Mary Ann had operated a bar called Pat and Mike's just down the road from Dave's dungeon. She began bartending and then proposed managing the bar. Dave was pleased with the job she did, and she took over the bulk of the day-to-day -day responsibilities. Mary Ann began reporting to Dave that a few men were repeatedly coming in and harassing her. She told him they were telling her that Dave had to join the club. Dave told Mary Ann to blow them off. On the last day Dave spoke to Marianne in person, she said she was sleeping with a gun because she was so fearful of these people. Dave suggested they go to the police, to which Marianne responded, they are the police. Dave was preparing to travel to upstate Wisconsin on a hunting trip, so he told Marianne he'd figured out what to do when he returned. On November 15, 1988, Dave set off on his trip. He was gone a week and a half. During that time, he was unreachable by the phone. Upon his return, his mom told him that Marianne had been found dead in her apartment in Manitowoc on the day Dave left. He couldn't believe it. He called a friend to go with him to Dave's dungeon. The bar was a mess and ransacked. It looked like it had been the scene of a big party. Everything of value was gone. Marianne's boyfriend, Dave doesn't remember his name, happened to drive by the bar and saw Dave's car parked outside. He stepped in and explained to Dave that he'd been the one to fa who found Marianne. He came home and discovered her lying in bed, covered in blood, dead with a gun on the nightstand. The boyfriend claims he called the police, and when they showed up, they immediately handcuffed him. They suspected he killed her due to all the blood. He wasn't cuffed for long, and they released him. He told Dave they deemed the death a heart attack. Dave didn't get further details about the incident. The boyfriend went on to tell him about the huge free-for-all party that had taken place. It had occurred the weekend after Marianne's death. He said he didn't know who opened the bar and or started the party, but apparently there were possibly hundreds of people there. What the heck in that little bar? After this, Dave decided to go talk to Marianne's teenage son. He didn't provide any useful details either. Dave did contact the police to report what had happened in his bar. He was informed that there was nothing the police could do. Wow, that's curious. So he goes to report this, and then they're like, oh yeah, there's nothing we can do. <laughs> that's weird. Dave was forced to declare a bankruptcy, and that was the end of Dave's dungeon. In the years after, Dave crossed paths with individuals who claimed to have been at this party. Several times he heard that people from the club were at the party giving everything away. So was this the something is going to happen that Dave was promised by the naked football coach guy? Another invitation. In the mid-90s, estimates it was 1995, Dave again experienced a brush with the club. He'd been invited to a local supper club, bar and restaurant by friends. He suspected these friends were knowledgeable about the club, and he'd recently begun asking them about it. They'd consistently avoided answering. On this night, after the restaurant crowd had thinned, the friends told Dave they had, su had a surprise for him. They led him over to some people sitting at another area of the bar. As he approached, a man introduced himself. It turned out he was the father of the kid who had spread the rumors about Dave's mom in high school. This guy said he wanted to invite Dave to join a special club. After realizing who the guy was, Dave told him to get bent. He also confronted him about the rumors regarding his mom and the harassment he and Marianne had been subjected to by this club. The man seemed stunned, and Dave headed out of the place. His friends caught up with him at the door and told him he had to go back. They were adamant that Dave should make nice and that he couldn't refuse this information. Dave asked them why he should. They said, for jobs, work, and money. He explained why he had no use for the guy handing out the invite and basically told them no thanks and left. Although another curious question for Dave Bogodka would be why he stuck around in the area from 86 to 95 in the first place after all that business with the club. Stephen Avery again. Stephen Avery gets exonerated for the assault on the beach. He's released from prison on September 11, 2003. I wonder if that's also a curiosity where they set that up somehow, some kind of occult reference. Dave sees this playing out in the media and can't believe it. Once again, the events he witnessed on the beach that day in 1985 are fresh in his mind. As time passes, Stephen Avery files his lawsuits, etc. Dave and Sandra follow the news coverage. 
Dave looks forward to further investigating Dave looks forward to further investigation into the crime on the beach. He's always felt there was something off about the things he saw that day. That, along with all that Dave has experienced regarding this club, is certainly enough to have him very curious about what in the hell is going on in the community. On the evening of October 31st, 2005, Dave and Sandra load their bicycles into the back of their truck. They drive from their home in Two Rivers, where they park by Walsh Field and unload the bikes. They ride around town checking out the Halloween decorations and getting some exercise. As they are heading back to their truck, they pass through the parking lot of Patsy's Highway 42 Mobile Mart in Two Rivers. At the gas station, Dave spots Steve and Avery. Dave says to Sandra, look, there's that Stephen Avery. The two stop their bikes on the edge of the gas station parking lot and watch him for a few minutes. He's driving a dark colored larger Ford truck. He's wearing a red and white jacket. He seems to be filling gas cans, the red plastic type. There also appears to be a blonde female with him. Sandra mentions to Dave that it looks like Stephen Avery is doing pretty good. Dave and his wife leave the area and continue back to their truck. Time, not sure of exact time. It was soon after dark. So someone found the following, which Dave posted on the Manitoba Topics Board in 2009. January 6, 2009. I see the Avery thing is back in the news. Here's what I have to say about that. I was involved in the search for the woman who got raped on the beach in the first Avery case. I was the first one to see her coming over the sand dunes and can say, looking back at it, I was disappointed by the police response. Here, here we are, standing where the guy who did it could not have been too far away. I suggested to the cop trying to chase down the guy. He said, no, we would mess up the crime scene. And it was left to the courts. I never testified because I did not really see anything, but what I did see was a very badly beaten woman who was horribly traumatized. After they convicted Mr. Avery, I would have been all for doing away with him. However, now we know what happened there. Funny, a friend of mine who was involved with the police back then told me that they were making sure he did not get out of it. Then on Halloween, the night of the recent killing, I was on a short bike ride in TR. Who did I see? Stephen Avery. He was getting gas at Ummy and Patsy's, filling gas cans in the back of his blue F-250. He had some people with him, including a young girl. However, I do not believe it was Miss Hallback. I almost expletive after the news came out. What are the chances of me getting that close to both crimes? It was funny. Our eyes met, and he gave me that stupid Stephen Avery grunt and looked very cocky. I also made eye contact with the girl sitting in the front seat. I think it was his niece. However, I was not paying a lot of attention. I did point him out to my wife, though. He was kind of a local character, being on the news so much with his lawsuit. I sent this info to the police and the DA and never heard a word. I have also heard, so the police had no interest in Avery's movements on Halloween. <laughs> the police had zero interest in, in Avery's movements. This is curious. Wow. I sent the, okay, I have also heard rumors flying around the area, Fisherville, that some of his, bo some of his buddies had a go at her also. The cops never get anything done, right? I have a feeling there is a lot left to the story. Detectives described their search on November 6, 2005 of Avery's truck, a Ford 350, which was parked in front of his garage. This truck matches the description that Bagatka gives of the truck, dark-colored, larger Ford, that he saw Avery driving shortly after it got dark on October 31, 2005. It got dark around 5 p.m. that day. Bagatka saw Avery's at Patsy's Highway 42, Mobile Mart, at 816 22nd Street, Two Rivers, Wisconsin filling gas cans, the red plastic type, and there was a blonde-haired woman with him. So that particular night, apparently sunset began at 4.50 p.m. So the sex club rumors. Now, there seems to be a lot of locals on this sub. Can any locals corroborate the YouTube videos in Dr. Nephilim 666 channel? I believe that was Dave Bogotka's channel, about some weird sex club that is composed of many powerful people in the area. Not sure if I believe this dude, but he seems honest enough, and the videos were posted a while before the documentary aired. 
Maybe he just fi finished watching True Detective Season 2. It may not be true, but one thing is certain, something very strange is and has been going on in Two Rivers. Some follow-up posts here. The possibility that major business owners and other powerful players in the community take part in these groups and hypothetically coerce and blackmail people into compliance is not far-fetched. If he witnessed something on the beach that day, it's not unreasonable to imagine they wanted him in that club to compromise him and his potential testimony. It also doesn't seem unreasonable to imagine a group with that sort of widespread influence flaunting their capacities to threaten people and flex some of their muscle. That, I imagine, was the purpose of showing him the photographs. There may perhaps be to an element of arrogant nonchalance, but that doesn't exclude the possibility of revealing to him the reach of this club, teachers, businessmen, cops, etc. We need the people in the community, perhaps more logically people who've since left the community, to corroborate the possible truth behind these claims. I would be inherently skeptical of anyone currently living in and around the Manitoc area with potential reason to discredit his story. The fear of dangerous reprisal for blowing the whistle on this sort of thing should not be taken lightly. That being said, it's important to approach both sides of these stories with open-minded skepticism. I'm personally of the mind that the presence of some organized club would help justify and explain the inexplicable behavior of the Sheriff's Department, Dassey's defense teams, and possibly even Judge Willis and Fox as the proceedings unfolded. It's also equally possible, as others have alluded in various threads, that the psychology behind psychophants like Len Kaczynski goes a long way towards explaining his willingness to aid the prosecution. The point is, there's a lot going on here. We'd be remiss to not consider every possibility and explore every angle, the club included. Someone actually found her cemetery listing, and it's not... 1986 it's 1988 what that means i don't know unless it's a typo on the cemetery listing records or bagatka was off by two years huh or one year a supposed local posted this i'll tell you one thing it's pretty expletive interesting that while i see businesses and homes shutting down and be put up for sale on a constant basis in this area I have never seen so many for sale signs and I've lived all over, including as far away as Florida, while the same families who have a name in the area always seem to do just fine regardless of how good or bad the economy is. <laughs> That's an interesting curiosity, is it not? Just ask the judge in the, in the Dassey case if his home has lost any property value over the last few years, then go out, knock on the door and ask his neighbors the next question. Huh. A post by Ed Vaness here. I've known and worked with Dr. Nephilim 666 slash Dave for many years, and I can tell you what he says is true. He does not BS. Wow. Just in Ion posted this. It's all a bit Twin Peaks. Even Two Rivers sounds eerily familiar. Teresa Hallback. Teresa Banks from Twin Peaks. A post from Bloated Bastard stated this, I thought about it too. Everything about this county sounds like Twin Peaks. A post from Dave Bagotka here, Mrs. Beerston talked about the jet ski thing in an interview a few years back, but it was like the cops did not want me to be involved from the start. I also got a $50 gift certificate from them to the candy store. Some of the local homeowners were complaining about noise of the jet skis. The story I was told on the heart attack was it ruptured into her lungs and windpipe, and she aspirated the blood. I always thought it sounded kind of shady, but she was a very heavy drinker and in pretty bad shape for a 42-year-old. She, she was managing the bar, and I was working full-time. I never got a straight answer from anybody. What happened to all my expletive? It was like they were as scared as her boyfriend after he found the body about talking who did what. She was also doing my taxes and all the paperwork for the bar and all of it got thrown away. So I had to file to the state to get back what she had sent them. It was such a mess. If you look up my name on the WCCA, you will see the tax warrants I got in trouble for. Them guys slammed me hard. I ain't making expletive up, and my memory is pretty good yet.
So here's an interesting post by Etherspin. They thought he had seen anomalies and spotted the actual perp. Verse Avery, who the cops in the club wanted away for potentially car ramming one of their members. So, regarding Bagotka, they, they thought he had seen anomalies, spotted the actual perp on the beach, and wanted blackmail material on him so they could stop him reporting anything about that day should the need arise. Besides the club, Dave says they were routinely sending people in requesting drugs and that when he wasn't on site at the bar, they'd managed to bust the place for letting in minors. Huh, that's weird. The stakes are high. Avery was put away. Henceforth, assume I'm buying Dave's info and also the cops actively tried to fit Avery up instead of being biased, mixed with incompetence. There are a lot of careers at stake. Well, you'd like to think, but nothing has happened since Avery was freed. In other jurisdictions and countries, I think heads would roll for sure. Which means normal wages, but also potential kickbacks for favors, which would make an average wage seem more meager. As for the club, it might seem far-fetched, as might the prospect of Calumet turning a blind eye to dodgy stuff with Lank. I think that brown-haired cop was a decent guy as opposed to the smart-ass cop who was there the day the key was found, perhaps examples of a partially compromised force. But once there is significant power in one town, you have people from the next town marrying sons of corrupt people jumping across to Calumet, intentional planning of corrupt people, Example, you take a guy who has been at Manitowoc in his role for 20 years and is eligible for retirement, but instead offer kickbacks to jump across to Calumet and apply for a job he is overqualified for. He aces the interview because of aptitude and experience and winds up also on the selection panel for new low-level employees and can favor newbie cops who are connected to dicey club people as well as controlling which people are on call or called in when something goes down. This would allow corruption of a major crime, so it can be blamed on the next person on the club's hit list. It sounds complex and far-fetched, but it's just another form of organized crime, and unfortunately, organized crime is still far too prevalent the world over. If you are part of this corrupt team, like imagine for a second that Kratz or his assistant were compromised, how cool would it be to have someone like Kaczynski, so peeved that he didn't get that job as a judge, wasn't he, who works with Mike Kelly under the employ of Dassey in the guise of defense, completely screws his case up, extracts all manner of conflicting but usable confessions from him. This changes the perception of Avery for the public and by extension the jury. Man, it would just be win-win and the fact that Kaczynski is not in jail or barred from practicing along with Michael, my god, the ribbon Kelly, makes you think, hmm, that judge who wouldn't let Brendan Dassey dismiss Lennon and get a new lawyer same person not finding Len in contempt of court. Is he compromised? So here's a post from David, from Dave Bogotka's wife. And it is curious, too, because if his wife didn't corroborate this, people would really write him off as an insane lunatic. But he's got a number of individuals corroborating his stories. Hey, y'all, I'm Dave's wife, the guy who made the videos. Yes, Dave is not excellent on video, and he does tend to skip around. He'd be the first to admit this. Anyway, we've seen several places where people intended to summarize his videos and they mix up the details and sort of butcher it. I have now transcribed a written statement of the events Dave's exper Dave experienced. He dictated it to me. And this is what we went over earlier before jumping into these comments. I met Dave in 1999 and I've heard all this info a lot throughout the years. So apparently, as far as 99, he's told her this information. So he didn't make this up after the documentary just for attention. The last part, Halloween evening 2005, I was with Dave for that part. I think we did a pretty good job in providing most of the important details. Dave's felt bad about this stuff for years. We hope that, some, that somehow sharing this info helps. And an interesting post, uh, someone asked her if they watched the Making a Murder documentary and what were their thoughts about it. So... Dave's wife here responds, we watched it, it's good. I think it does an excellent job of showing that there were plenty of problems. As far as Stephen Avery goes, Dave told me he and many of his family were a bit different years ago. But Stephen family members used to come to the open air bar festival area where Dave was a bouncer at Harps Lake. And he says he never had any troubles from them. 
Dave did hear about the cat burning incident around the time it happened. He did hear that Avery and others put flammable stuff on the cat and tossed it in the fire. That being said, Avery admitted to it at the time, got in trouble for it. Although, again, Yanda was the one who admitted in a written police statement that he picked up the cat and threw it in the fire. But Avery admitted, of course, that he was there and he was somehow involved to a certain capacity in a drunken stupor. I don't know what to make of that. I'd also add that when I was growing up, I'm aware of many boys in my class in a very small town who abused animals. Some of it was pretty horrific. It pissed me off. But those guys didn't grow up to become rapist murderers as far as I know. Based on what Dave has told me, I'd say the Averys are a close-knit bunch, but they have their family drama. Drinking, domestic altercation, family feuds, etc. I know a few people like that, and I'd say it's fairly common. I don't think it makes it obvious people in those situation or culture are going to be murderers by default, but I also do not know what happened to Teresa Hallback. Could Avery have murdered her? Yes. Do he and Brendan Dassey deserve a fair trial according to the laws of our land? Yes. Did they get one? It doesn't appear they did. If law enforcement was so focused on Avery, did they neglect to follow up on other leads? There's also a lot of talk that supports that. And so, a murderer could still be on the loose. Also, all the club stuff, whatever that is, a mafia-like organization racketeering group that engages in orgies, prominent businessmen, politicians going around, whipping out naked pictures to show people, that's totally weird in my book. But hey, if consenting adults want to get together to have sex parties or whatever, fine. But if it's being used as a means to blackmail, coerce, manipulate people, business, politics, that's shady. Not to mention the rumors about the occult stuff. Dave and I think that this group, the club, could most definitely be involved in the Avery saga, as well as a multitude of other corruption. Do we think police judges, others in political positions, people of great influence could be involved in this club? Of course, it seems highly likely. Precisely what this club has or had orchestrated in this case investigation crime, we can only speculate. So much does not add up, I think most people would agree on that. Another post here, I agree, when listening to Dave's video on YouTube, I got such a bad feeling when he stated that a couple of these guys from the club lived next door to Avery. So who's he talking about? Is he talking about Redont? Because I did go over Redont in the previous podcast. Make sure you check that out if you haven't. There's some shady issues with Redont. Again, I'm not alleging he is or isn't responsible for anything, but there's some unanswered questions for sure. I don't know how far-fetched this is, but if some of Avery's neighbors were members of this so-called club, they don't even have to be neighbors, maybe just police officers, investigators, DAs, could they have been the ones to orchestrate the murder? Could have it been some form of ritual? This murder is too coincidental. It happened just two days before Manitowoc is supposed to pay out tons of money to Avery. Also, could the Dassey boy have overheard something or was told to say what he said? The story he initially told is a bit sadistic. I feel like he's keeping a secret but is scared to tell the truth. Maybe he was threatened. I don't know, but the prosecutors from Calumet County didn't seem right to me. They gave me a creepy feeling when they talked. When I heard about Kratz being a sex addict, I said to myself, I knew it. Also, the police officer that called in the tags, something was a, wasn't right about him either or his tag story. Another post from Dave Bagotka here. Something else. I was messing around one night with a woman I knew in one of the apartments above my bar that was empty at the time. I ended up leaving some used condoms on the floor. I went up there the next day to get rid of them, but to get rid of them before a possible new renter was going to look at the apartment and they were gone. Somebody had keys to the place because it was burglarized more than once. So when I am implicated by these expletives in their next satanic ritual, that is how they got my DNA. I could never figure out who would want to take something like that and why. Looking back, I feel a lot of what I thought was just bad luck was these guys setting me up. I had multiple personal injury lawsuits against me. The slumlord department was on me steady. I had a guy suing me for a fixture that was in the place when I purchased it. It was broke into and burglarized it got busted for serving minors. I had undercover cops in there all the time trying to buy drugs from me, and I never sold drugs. It was like I had a target on my back with the other local bar owners. They were always messing with me and turning me in for stupid expletive. 
I also said it was a rumor about JFK, but I have heard it from more than one person that you would never think would be involved with something like this. I know it sounds crazy, that is why I never believed it, and just gave my opinion on what it could be. The NSA and CIA are decades ahead of the general public with technology, and now you can buy devices that can speak right into your head and even control things like drones and a mouse on a computer with your mind. If you want to call me a liar or crazy, fine, but look expletive up before you do. Yeah, I mean, that, that, those technological advances and leaps are, are pretty crazy, of course. I mean, I don't know what the estimate is, that the military is about 50 years ahead of civilian tech, something like that. So here's another post... I don't know if this is Bagatka or his wife. We reported the info to the sheriff's department now 10 years later after this is the info regarding them spotting Avery at the gas station. Now 10 years later after the documentary, everybody suspects the sheriff's department of being super corrupt and obviously not the ones to report anything to, so it seems. But at the time, we thought we were doing the right thing in reporting it to law enforcement. We have reported to both the old attorneys and the new attorney. Not one of them has returned our calls or emails. We've been told that an employee at the gas station also saw Mr. Avery that night. But we do not know if this person has gone to the lawyers. We've been encouraging anyone with info to speak up. Now it is the time while the eyes of the world are on this. So that's pretty much the rundown with Bogotka. Uh, we'll see what he responds to. He usually does comment on Mindshock videos, so we'll see if he has any further statements. But moving on here, 